Today, I'm going to be taking Kerbal's Interplanetary for the first time in order to satisfy the contract, Explore Eve. This contract requires us to perform an Eve flyby and return the vessel safely back to Kerbin's surface. Not only will I be showing you how to perform this mission, but I will present two different ways of getting the job done. This video will present the easier way of doing it, while part two will present the more fuel efficient way. In addition, I will show you how to use phase angles to set up interplanetary transfers without having to use the game's built-in maneuver tool. Finally, this will be the first vessel of this series that will make use of the LV-N NERV atomic rocket motor. So I'll take a look at some of the considerations involved in using this highly efficient engine. Let's get started. And as always, we'll start by taking a look at the contract, Explore Eve. So going through the objectives here, basically it's a pretty simple one as far as what you need to do. You need to fly by Eve, gather some scientific data from Eve, and then return to Kerbin from a flyby of Eve. And of course, really healthy cash, science, and reputation for this mission. Now we have been to Eve before, but that was one to establish an orbit and not to come back. So I made that an uncrewed mission. However, this one is coming back to Kerbin. That is one of the requirements. So we're gonna make this one crewed. We're gonna be sending our first Kerbals to another planet. Now, in my mind, there are kind of two ways of dealing with this fly by Eve and then return back to Kerbin once again. It does work if you just get an orbit. If you've entered Eve's SOI and leave it again, they call that a flyby, even if you got an orbit in the interim. So you can get an orbit of Eve, spend some time around Eve, and then break away from the orbit and get back to Kerbin. Now, the reason why that's actually the simpler way to do it is because you can use the maneuver tools that are built into the game to set up the transfers to Eve and then back again. However, if you want to do a true flyby, you don't actually get an orbit. But the problem is when you go to do the flyby, you'll end up leaving Eve's orbit in some other orbit that is pretty much guaranteed not to intersect with Kerbin. I'm going to look at doing both ways. First, the simple way of getting an orbit and coming back, but I'm also going to do this as a true flyby and show you how you can manipulate that trajectory so that you do, well, eventually end up coming back to Kerbin. But let's take a look at some of the tech requirements for this mission. Uh, one thing is to note, I do have a tier three tracking station. You can do this mission with just a tier two tracking station without any problem. That isn't a necessity, but of course with the tier three station, you do get a better signal back and forth with Eve. But what I'm more interested in is getting into research and development and unlocking a few more nodes. So I'll open up the whole tech tree so you can sort of see where I am at. And one of the nodes I'm going I right away is right here for 300 science nuclear propulsion this gives us the LV-N nerve atomic rocket motor a nuclear engine is an exceedingly high efficient engine uh, if I click over here it has an ISP of 800 seconds far exceeding any of the chemical rockets that are available in the game. It is, however, relatively heavy and relatively low thrust, but we'll talk about how we deal with that in a little bit. But we'll unlock that one. Also going to take a look here at specialized control for 160 science, mostly because I want to get these advanced reaction wheel module large. This is a 2.5 meter diameter reaction wheels. You can get away without having this, but it makes sometimes those bigger boosters easier to build. So I'm going to grab at that. And I'm also going to grab over here, aerodynamics. Because you guys haven't been picking the plane missions in my YouTube polls, I really have been ignoring this kind of section of the tree. But what I want, and you'll see why I want them, I want this small nose cone. That's really the only thing I'm after. This is a 0.625 meter nose cone. So for a measly 90 science, I'm going to grab that one as well. Alrighty, let's get started with our build. 
But of course we can't start our build without having a budget. Now I did mention, I'm gonna look at this at two different ways. So I'm gonna budget for the more expensive way and then I'll be able to use this vessel for both ways of doing it. And the more expensive way is to get the orbit about Eve and then leaving orbit to come back from Kerbin. So that's what we're gonna do the budget for. So let's pull up our Delta V map. Again, there's a link down there in the description if you don't have one of these for yourself. But I'm going to assume, this being fairly late in this series, that people have used these before, are kind of used to them. Remember how these work. You pick your destination, in this case Eve, and then you simply follow the route out there, adding the numbers along the way. And if we do that, we see a 930 meters per second for our Kerbin ejection, and then 90 meters per second for the Eve transfer, but don't neglect this 430 meters per second to deal with the inclination difference between Kerbin's orbit and Eve's orbit. This number is a worst case scenario, but it's best to budget for the worst case scenario, so we're gonna be adding that on. Then our Eve capture is 80 meters per second. To get down to our orbit is another 1300 meters per second, so now we're in orbit about Eve. To get ourselves back again, all we gotta do then is simply follow these numbers back. So it's a 1300 meters per second, then plus 80, plus 90, plus the 430. That's a total of 1900 to get back. You don't count the 930 for the Kerbin ejection because that's where you're gonna be using Kerbin's atmosphere to slow yourself down, bleed off speed, and then use parachutes to get down to the surface. And if we add that all up, that comes up to a total budget for our orbiter portion of the vessel of 4,730 meters per second. Again, this does not count the booster to get this thing into orbit in the first place. I like to add on about a further 1,000 meters per second so that this vessel will take care of the upper part of our orbital insertion about Kerbin as well. Now, I'm gonna build this in two stages. And for the top stage, I want it to have a delta V of less than 3,700 meters per second. Now why? Well, if we take a look at our total budget of 4,730, this is a, about a, a little over a thousand less than that, which means that by the time we're staging, we should have exited Kerbin's SOI. Remember, Kerbin's ejection is only 930 meters per second. This way, that lower stage will be discarded while we're in orbit about the sun, and then we'll have debris around the sun rather than debris hanging around in Kerbin's orbit. This is a personal aesthetic choice on my part, but that's what I like to do, so that's what I'm going to be doing. So what my first plan here is to build my top stage that has my Kerbals in it with a budget of something less than 3,700 meters per second. So we're gonna start off with the Mark 1-3 command pod. I'm gonna make this a pretty simple rocket. This is gonna be my only crew compartment I'm going to do. I am going to take out all the monopropellant to save weight, and we're going to only send two Kerbals. Now, if you want to role play that they need to have more space, really simple thing to do is to put on a hitchhiker can underneath that. It fits on very, very well. So now they have more space to move around. And in fact, a really excellent part to put on these really long missions is a science lab. And you can do that if you like. A science lab is great because this is gonna be a long mission. So you have all that time to process all of that science, but I already have two science labs, one in orbit about the moon, one sitting on the surface of Minmus. They are cranking out so much science for me. I, I'm not gonna go there. So I'm gonna keep this as simple as I can by taking this stuff off. And that saves me quite a bit of mass as well. Continuing on under thermal, this is the thing that's going to be descending through Kerbin's atmosphere at the end. So it's going to need a heat shield on the bottom. Up at the top, I mean, I do want to put the standard parachute of the Mark 16 extra large parachute would be the one to go on here, but I like to put the launch escape system above this. Again, this is a role playing thing on my part. It's completely optional and you can not do that if you like, but in order to fit on said launch control system, we're gonna put on a fairing base here. Then we're gonna put the parachute on top of the fairing base. And then I'm going to turn on the interstage nodes and I'm actually gonna turn off the truss structure. So what this does is it gives me some extra nodes that I can put the launch escape system on. Uh, I'll do that a little bit later, but I just wanted to have those nodes available for me. Anyway, underneath we're gonna to need to build ourselves some form of service module. So on goes the TD-25 decoupler. And then I wanna create kind of a space down here. Now you can use 
the uh, service bays like these, they, they have quite a lot of space in there, but they are quite a bit heavier. And what's sometimes a lighter option is to again get a fairing base. So I'm going to get the 2.5 meter fairing base. We're going to stick this right on here like so. We're not going to build the fairing. Then I'm going to turn on the interstage nodes. And then I'm simply going to move this down so that I have a nice big space. That's actually a little bit too big of a space, quite frankly. There, that looks about right. And then in here, I can start putting my sciencey stuff. So going down into science, we're going to bring along a science junior. Now, speaking of science, with our Eve probe, I ended up transmitting all of that science back because that probe is still in orbit about Eve. But this thing is going to come back. And that means I don't have to transmit it. I can collect all the science into the command pod and bring that science back. And actually, that's kind of nice because transmitting over long distances with the big antennas can be a bit of an electrical demand. So I don't have to worry about working on how much electricity to bring along. So I'm just going to throw on an arbitrary a Z1K battery for just a thousand more units of electricity. And then for the solar generation, I'm going to use the OX-4L 1x6 photovoltaic panels. This is actually, I don't even need this much, but just to have something, I put on two of them, so there's some symmetry to that. But with that, let's finish off our science. So after adding on a couple of cubic octagonal struts, I put on a mystery goo, magnetometer, and then on the back of the science junior, the GravMax gravioli detector, thermometer, barometer, made sure to put an EVA science kit into the cargo compartment of the command capsule, as well as a repair kit in case we break something. But with that all done, it's now time to start thinking about propulsion. So we're going to start off by just putting on a Rockle Max brand two adapter down here to provide a bit of a transition. Now, as I mentioned, we are going to use the Nerve nuclear engine. And one of the things to notice with the Nerve nuclear engine is that if you go down here to the propellant part, there's no oxidizer. It is simply just liquid fuel. The way a nuclear engine works is it uses a nuclear reaction, in this case a fission reaction, to superheat that propellant, get it really, really hot so it wants to expand, and then the only option it's given as far as expanding goes is out the nozzle at the back, and that's what provides thrust. It doesn't have to be fuel. It doesn't have to be something you can burn. You could do this with water. You can do this with hydrogen. So that is the reason why oxidizer is not required because there's nothing here to burn. So the only propellant I need to provide is liquid fuel. So I'm going to go over here to my fuel tanks. Now, one of the options is to grab, you know, one of your more standard fuel tanks and then just simply take the oxidizer out. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the Mark 1 liquid fuel fuselage that we typically would use for jets, but I'm going to be using it for this because that has only liquid fuel in it under which I'm going to put the nerve engine. So that gives us, make sure that's on vacuum, so far 1700 meters per second and a thrust to weight ratio of 0.6. Adequate, but I want it to get closer. I want it to be less than 3700 meters per second, but I don't want it to be 2000 meters per second less. So I need to add on a little bit more liquid fuel. So I'm gonna go back to my tanks. I'm going to grab the Mark Zero liquid fuel fuselage and we're gonna put on six of these, like so. And then I'm going to grab one of them, copy it, and then I'm going to put on six more for a total of 12. And now you can see my delta V is up to 3,606 meters per second. Thrust to weight ratio 0.45, perfectly serviceable once you are in orbit. Uh, you don't need to have a high thrust to weight ratio, especially when you're in interplanetary space. So this is going to service us very, very well. Now I do want to clean this up a little bit. So I'm going to grab my small nose cones that I unlocked. This is why I got them simply to stick them on the bottom here. And then we're going to open, get our translate tool, put this on local, and I'm going to translate this upwards so that the top of these tanks, we'll take the snap off, disappears into the adapter up there. And then we're gonna translate them inwards so that about half the nose cone shows to make this look a little bit sleeker. Let's see, how's that look? That's looking, I think, pretty good. Take that off like that. Now, some people do get down on the nuclear engine because it does have a very high mass and a very low thrust. So they get down on the fact that it's thrust to mass ratio is pretty low. 
and think about things like the Terrier, which has a much higher thrust to mass ratio. However, what you're losing with the mass of that engine, you're more than making up with mass of propellant. I need far less propellant. And if you build the sort of chemical equivalent of this, something that's using a chemical engine like the Terrier, but then liquid fuel and oxidizer, you'll find out the total mass of your vessel is actually going to end up being higher to get the same delta V as this out of it. So don't get too down on that low thrust to mass ratio. It's the mass of the whole vehicle that matters, not just the engine. The last time I went to EVE, I was transmitting science back to the KSC and went with two HG-55 antennas to give me a strong signal strength. But now that I'm bringing the science back, I'm stepping that down to two of the lighter DTS-M1 antennas, which will still get me a signal, just not always a strong one. Finally, with the addition of some obligatory lights, the vehicle was complete. Next was to add a stage to bring the total delta V up to my budget of around 5,700 meters per second. That stage consisted of a TD-12 decoupler, another 2.5 meter fairing base, and then three strut connectors to shore up this connection. For propulsion, this stage will be chemical with an X200-32 fuel tank and the ever reliable RE-1110 Poodle liquid fuel engine. And after fixing up the staging, that got me a total delta V of 5,741 meters per second and a TWR of 0.75. Now I gotta get this thing ready for launch, starting with the launch escape system. So I'm going to get a TD-12 decoupler. Now you can see here, there are a lot of nodes because I got nodes coming from multiple fairings below. All you got to do if you if you're getting confused with nodes is turn off the nodes on the ones you don't want anymore so I'm going to turn off the interstage nodes on this one and turn off the interstage oh they were never turned on in the first place and now the only interstage nodes I see are the ones from this one here turning off the interstage nodes doesn't mess what you've done so far so that's perfectly fine. I can leave them off if I wanted to. I'm gonna flip that upside down put that on the bottom like that I'm also going to if Take that truss structure, I'm going to turn it off just because I think it looks better with it not there. Remember this is going to get covered with a fairing anyway and then on top of that is going to go my launch escape system. And now we're going to go down here and we're going to build this entire fairing just coming straight up like this. A large fairing like this is a lot of mass and where it is in the staging diagram will affect the calculated delta V of your vessel. So make sure you have it in the approximate location where it will be deployed or else the DV calculation will not be accurate. After this I set up action groups for the fairing deployment as well as the abort action group. Then it was on to the booster. And clearly this is going to take a fairly large booster. And if you need to go over the principles behind building a rocket like this, you can check out this video here. But for those following along with this build, I will quickly go over the booster now. First, there came a TD-25 decoupler, then my new large set of reaction wheels, then a jumbo 64 fuel cam, followed by the main sail engine and six small tail fins. That takes care of the central core. Now for a pair of radial boosters, each consisting of a TT-70 radial decoupler, X200-32 fuel tank, X200-8 fuel tank, and a skipper engine. Then came a slanty fuel can topped with the slanty nose cone. This rocket will employ asparagus staging with all three engines going off at launch. This is done by using external fuel ducts to feed fuel and oxidizer from the two radial boosters to the central core. Finishing off, to help with staging, I added a pair of separatrons to each radial booster and to stiffen the rocket up, some strut connectors on the boosters, as well I used the auto strut feature to attach to the heaviest part, all the parts from the large reaction wheels on up to the Mark I fuel tank on the orbiter. And after tweaking down the thrust on the skipper engines to achieve a reasonable launch thrust to weight ratio, this thing was ready to fly. Because I am going interplanetary, I'm going to put this into a 90 kilometer orbit. That orbit is of course circular and equatorial to help facilitate our transfer to EVE. 
And while I make my ascent, I want to take this opportunity to send my most grateful thanks to all of my Patreon patrons and YouTube members who continue to inspire me to put these videos out on a regular basis. In particular, I want to welcome aboard my most recent patrons, Brandy Marie, Cygnus008, and Alan Atkinson. If you are enjoying the content that you are seeing, don't forget to hit like and subscribe, and if you are so inclined, you will find the links to join my members and patrons down below this video. Alright, now with that orbit established, it's time to see what the maneuver tool is going to give us. So if I go down here to the maneuver tool and simply select EVE as our target. It is calculating a nice 1017 meter per second burn for us. And I'm gonna take, don't create the alarm, I'm gonna check that off. And we'll take a look at that. Now the thing to notice is, is that this burn's coming up in one year, 306 days. And if you want to go ahead and time warp to that, it's not a problem, no life support in this game, no problem at all. But if I go over to map view, and scroll on out, there is our burn. But if I look at Eve's position now relative to Kerbin, what I want to take a note of is something called its phase angle. Now the phase angle is a very simple thing. Imagine a line going from where you are on Kerbin to the center of the parent body, which in this case is the sun. So imagine a line from Kerbin to the sun. Now imagine a line from Eve to the sun. And that's going to create an angle right here at the sun. We call that angle the phase angle. Now the angle is measured from where you are in a counterclockwise direction, the same direction that everything orbits, to where it is you want to go. So actually the phase angle is this way if you want to go in a positive direction, or this way if you want to go in a negative direction. Now, there is a correct phase angle for doing your transfers from any planet to any other planet. And I have a video here on how to calculate these for yourself, but you can also look them up online. It's pretty simple. And from Kerbin to Eve, the phase angle should be negative 54 degrees. Now, this angle from here to here in my brain is more than negative 54 degrees. Eve is going faster than Kerbin because Eve is in a lower orbit. So that means that it's catching up to us and this phase angle is getting lower and lower. In fact, it looks to me like we shouldn't be all that far from when our correct transfer is going to be. It certainly isn't in one year, 306 days. So we can live with this, but why don't I take this opportunity to talk about how you can set this up without using this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just simply get rid of this. Now the first thing you want to do is definitely do a quick save before because we're going to do some massive time warping. It's easy to over time warp and then want to go back. So do yourself a quick save. There we go. Okay, we want this phase angle to be negative 54. Now if I set Eve as a target, set that as a target, and if I go over to the approach info for Eve, it does give me a phase angle. You might be sitting there going, oh, this is great. Uh, I got a phase angle right here, but it's 109 negative, negative 110 now, and it's increasing rapidly. This angle doesn't seem to be changing that quickly. What's going on? Well, here's what's going on. Let me focus this back on Kerbin. It's measuring the phase angle using Kerbin as the parent body, not the sun. So it's measuring our craft to Kerbin and making a line that way. Then it's taking Eve, connecting it to the sun. So it's got a line going this way, a line kind of going this way and where they meet, it's measuring that angle. But we can actually kind of get this close to the right phase angle by simply thinking, well, when our ship is directly opposite from the sun from Kerbin, and that's gonna happen when it's in the middle of the, let's center this on Kerbin, when it's on the middle of the dark side of Kerbin, so right around here, our line joining our ship to Kerbin will actually be going through the sun as well. That will be the line that will actually get us the correct phase angle. So we're gonna do a little bit of time warping, keeping this centered on Kerbin, until our ship 
or as close as we can estimate it in the center. I find it easier if I get the terminator to be horizontal, right about there. And I'm getting that our phase angle's in around 84 degrees, negative 84 degrees is our true phase angle with Eve. Now, this is obviously a bit inaccurate. One alternative to doing this is literally getting a protractor, plopping it on your screen and measuring this angle. Another alternative is to install a mod called Kerbal Engineer. I don't have this installed here because I promised this would be mod free, but Kerbal Engineer will measure that correct phase angle for you. But I'm not gonna do that here. Instead, what I'm going to do is do a little bit of time warping. Notice how Eve is coming closer and closer to us. Now I'm gonna cut the time warp. Gonna go back on us, center this back on Kerbin, time warp some more so that our ship is in the middle of the night. And I'm seeing a phase angle now of negative 65 degrees. So we're gonna time warp a little bit more again. And if anything, you wanna stop this process early. Don't let it go too, because it's easy to move a maneuver forward in time. Little trick here to move it backwards in time. It's a little bit higher than our negative 54. So at this point, I think is a good time to set up our burn for Eve. Now, let's keep this in mind. Go to Eve. We are burning inwards. So that means we need to eject ourselves in a retrograde direction relative to Kerbin's orbit about the sun. So we need to eject ourselves off in this way. So that means our burn is going to be over here, about-ish. And again, it's about a thousand meters per second, so we'll stick in about th there. That's that's pretty close for now, so that we're kind of tur turking off in this direction. And we can see here, I already have my periapsis too low, so I can dial that back a little bit. Okay, so you can see I'm not getting my intercept numbers, and that's because, well, there's an inclination difference. So if you actually look at where our periapsis is, you can see our periapsis is actually quite a bit above Eve's orbit. And so this isn't going to be the greatest of encounters. And to be honest, that's probably why the maneuver tool is skipping this one. It probably looked at it and said, I don't like it. It's, it's too far. You know, we're going to have to do a big, huge correction. Let's do the one after that. Well, forget you maneuver tool. I want to leave now. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a ink, another second maneuver at about the halfway point, around where the ascending node is, that actually tells you that the ascending node being at about the halfway point means that this is about as bad as it go, it's gonna get. And actually, since it is so close to where the ascending node is, why don't we try and zero out this inclination? So I can see I need to bring this down anti-normal. I do wanna emphasize that you don't have to do this correction at the AN or the DN. I'm doing it here because the AN happens to be at about the halfway point to Eve. If the AN and the DN are nowhere near the halfway point to Eve, then don't do it there. Do it at the halfway point to Eve. But now that I got my inclination down to zero, I can go back now to my first maneuver using the tool down here. And I can see my periapsis is a little on the low side. I can also see I'm starting to get my intercept marks. So now I play with the prograde retrograde of the first maneuver. That's the one in low orbit about Kerbin until I get the encounter. Don't forget that you can also adjust the exact timing of the burn, including the option to hop ahead orbits so that the burn is later. But before too long, you should find that you get that Eve encounter. I like to continue to fine tune this. I want to eventually insert into a 120 kilometer orbit about Eve, which will get me that near space science while still being comfortably above Eve's atmosphere of 90 kilometers. So I'm getting my closest approach as close to 120 kilometers as I can and as close to equatorial as I can. This tuning is first done by making tiny adjustments to the first maneuver, either in the prograde retrograde direction or with the timing. And once you have that as close as you can, you can fine tune this further with more tiny adjustments on the second maneuver, either in the normal or radial direction. But it doesn't have to be perfect. There is plenty of time for further corrections along the way. So once you're happy, it's time to perform the burn. Perform the first burn as accurately as you can, but any inaccuracies that you encounter can still be easily corrected with further tweaks to the mid-course correction maneuver node. 
As these are my first Kerbals to exit Kerbin's SOI, there was a bounty of science to collect once I was orbiting the Sun. But once that was accomplished, I just time warped to that mid-course correction. Along the way, I was also treated to my first sighting of a comet in this game. Very exciting. Take your time with these mid-course corrections. There's no need to rush, and if you aren't happy with the result after completing the burn, there's plenty of time to try again. I ended up with an actual collision with Eve when I was all done, but I was very happy with the small inclination of this trajectory, so I decided to leave this until I was actually in Eve's SOI, where a small radially outburn performed just after entering Eve's SOI pushed my periapsis to my 120 km target. Note, by the way, how the flyby requirement of the contract has already been checked off. All that is left to do to complete the contract is to get our Kerbals back home. And I think the easiest way to do this is simply by getting a capture of Eve first. Don't forget, next episode I'll show you how this can be done without getting the capture. But for now, let's just time warp down to the capture burn while, of course, collecting all the science that I can along the way. Four, three, two, one, and go. I set up this burn to get me a low circular orbit, but I realized part way through that I neglected my inclination. Though low, my inclination is not zero, and it's very likely that on another EVE encounter I won't be so lucky to get an inclination as low as what I have here. To fix inclination, you want to be going as slow as possible, and that means being far away from the parent body. When I realized I do want to fix my inclination, I cut throttle while my apoapsis was still high. So let's talk about how to get inclination to zero. To zero this out, we need to get an estimate of where our equatorial ascending and descending nodes are. Unfortunately, the game doesn't give us anything to help us indicate that. So what we have to do is really kind of guess at this. So looking at this, I can see, yeah, it's putting this on edge and trying to guess at where we're crossing the equator, maybe around here. Let's make that as our guess. So I can see here, I, I need to bring this up, I believe. So I'm going to just go with a little bit of positive normal and see what effect does that have on my inclination. I can see that it's bringing it down. It's now at two. So I'm going to bring this down as far as I can. Hopefully I can get it right down to zero. And it's around 0.5 and then it started going back up again. So that means I'm not quite in the right spot. But do I need to go this way? To the right or to the left? Well, there's really no way to know. You just have to kind of guess. So let's go here and let's see if I can bring my inclination down further still. Oh, well, that's... Now I need to go anti-normal. Oh, 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 I got it down to 0.1 there for a second. So maybe a little bit further along this way. See if I can bring it down again. 0, 0.0 right there. And the closer you can get your inclination to zero, the easier it's going to be for the maneuver tool to get yourself back to curb. And anyway, we got ourselves a 14 meter per second burn coming up, so let's perform that. And what I'm really looking at, more than I'm looking at the maneuver node itself, or the burn indicator itself, is looking at my inclination. I want that to be zero. Let's cut throttle here a little bit, a little more. 0 0.10, there we go, we're good. Now I just need to get back down to periapsis to complete my insertion into low orbit, after which Bob has all the time he wants to collect all the science that he can. But eventually there comes a time to head back home, so let's see what the maneuver tool will do for us. So clicking on the maneuver tool, I now have to go back to Kerbin, and it's calculating a maneuver, create that maneuver, that maneuver is in one year and 97 days. Now, before we had a situation where the maneuver it created was quite a ways ahead in the future, perhaps this one's a little bit better. So let's go out and take a look at map view and take a look at the situation where Kerbin is and where Eve is. Now here we can see the unfortunate situation that we are in. We are in an orbit lower than Kerbin, so Eve is going around faster 
then Kerbin is going around in its orbit. So we have to wait until Eve comes all the way around and is in a relative position. And by the way, there is a phase angle from going from Eve to Kerbin, and that phase angle is a positive 36 degrees. Remember how phase angle works? Draw a line from where you're at to the sun or whatever body it is that you're orbiting. Draw a line from your target to that same body measure in a counterclockwise direction so the phase angle would actually be this whole angle here all the way around we need that to be 36 it is nowhere near 36 so i strongly expect that actually this is our next transfer in one year and 97 days so there's nothing for it we just have to time warp until that burn is upon us at this point, some of you may be thinking that the total time for this mission will be reduced when I don't get the capture and do a true flyby next episode. Well, I hate to disappoint, but as you'll see, though the flyby technique saves fuel, it actually makes the entire mission time longer. The fact is, other than by expelling a lot more propellant on the transfers and the captures on the other side, there really is no way to prevent this from being a two year plus mission. That said, it's not like these two years went to waste. You may have even noticed the alarms earlier at the top left of the screen telling me to visit my moon station and Mimis base. Those were to transmit the science that was being generated from the labs. I even took the time to leave those respective bases to collect more science data from a new biome so that it could be fed to the scientists back in the labs. In fact, while Jeb and Bob were still orbiting Eve, I'd already had enough science at the KSC to unlock the entire tech tree should I choose. And that is without all the science Bob collected during this Eve mission. Sorry Bob. But as Jeb and Bob close in on finally putting their boots back down on Kerbin's surface, why don't I take this opportunity to go over the main takeaways from this episode. The maneuver tool is great at finding efficient transfers, but it doesn't always find the most timely ones. For this reason, it's good to know how to create interplanetary transfers manually. Understanding how phase angle works goes a long way to making setting up these transfers easier. During the build, we spent some time going over the Nerve Atomic Rocket Motor and how to determine whether it would be a suitable engine for the craft that you are building. Though the contract requirement was to perform a flyby of EVE, we discovered that getting a capture still satisfies that requirement and makes the transfer back to Kerbin easier to set up. And finally, I looked at how to zero the inclination of your orbit even when you can't be sure exactly where the ascending and descending nodes of that orbit are. And with that, I'm going to be drawing this episode to a close. Jeb and Bill will be back going around Eve next episode, and I'll be looking at how to complete this contract without having to get the capture about Eve. I hope to see you then.